John Jolliffe, welcome back to the Spirit Farm podcast. Thank you very much, Caleb. It, Wonderful to be back. It's always great to have you. You're back by popular demand, but also because you're one of my favorite people to talk to. And uh, it's January of a new year and a new decade, so I thought who better to help give us an introduction to the idea, the psychology of resolutions than you. Well, it is that time when people are putting together their New Year's resolutions. Maybe you've already started. But I thought before we talk about strategies, how to make these working realities for 2020, we should discuss uh, habits. Because the dynamic of any new resolution, whether it's going to be successful or not, has to do with being able to manage, not conquer, but to manage habits. So I thought maybe in my opening remarks, uh, we should talk about habits, we should talk about what resolutions actually are, and then you and I can discuss uh, seven strategies uh, to make them working realities. I think that's that's fantastic. Even the people that have already done their New Year's resolutions uh, are probably struggling with them, and maybe uh, one or two have fallen off uh, and then for the people who yeah. are, who maybe are anti New Year's resolutions, I think having you re- <laughs> reframe it uh, as habits and strategies will will be helpful all the way around. So yeah, let's jump into habits. Well, you know, New Year's resolutions are really renunciation of old habits. That's what they really are. It's regrets looking backwards. I'm going to talk to you and show you how you can actually change the past. Because people talk about that all the time. I wish they could change the past. Well, after today's talk and our interview, I'm going to actually show you how you can change the past. But let's talk about habits to begin with. A habit is a thing that's usually done often and it's done easily. It's a practice, it's a custom, or it's an act that's acquired, or it's integrated into your behavior that no longer requires conscious effort. And so one of the questions people ask is, how long does the behavior have to be repeated before it is considered a habit? The simple answer is, until it has enslaved or mastered you. Hmm. Because one of the truths about habits is they possess us. Hmm. We don't have habits. They have us. And these conditioned responses appear to disappear by disuse. Hmm. However, habits can never be entirely unlearned. For as long-term memory, well-established habits and habit pathways do not disappear with time. I mean, do you really think that you could forget knowing how to ride a bicycle? Hmm. And I don't know when the last time you rode a bicycle, but it becomes a habit pathway. We learn certain skills, and you never forget them. That's true for constructive habits, and it's also con- uh, true for destructive habits. Yep. And so what is life then? Life is more about better and better management, not about cures. Hmm. The interesting thing about habits is the earlier in life a habit is formed, the more enduring it will become. So self-destructive habits are easier to learn. They provide quicker rewards. They require less discipline, determination, and self-sacrifice than self-inhabiting habits. And when you say self-inhabiting, you mean... Or enhancing, okay. you know, there's there's self-enhancing habits. Yeah. It's kind of like positive habits, sure. like learning to brush your teeth, uh, you know, learning to do certain things. Yep. It, you know, self-destructive habits are always more difficult yeah. than self-enhancing ones yep. to modify or correct for the simple reason that their existence is denied. Hmm. Denial being the insistence that what is, isn't. And so, remember, what you don't acknowledge lives with us until we do. So, although it's impossible to cure yourself of a habit, they can be managed. 
And it sounds like and we can, step one yeah. of the management is acknowledging and, and owning it and, and resisting the shame that otherwise goes along with it. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly right. I think it's, it's it, the, that which you own, you can discuss. Yeah. And that which you can discuss, you can, you can rectify. Mm. But if you cannot begin by discussing it, because it's not happening, it's denied, it's ignored, then they possess us. Yeah. So I think the, the first step in the strategy, you, you remember the old saying, uh, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step? Sure, yeah. Well, you, you may remember, I, I think that's abhorrent. <laughs> I've never liked that statement. I always thought it was uh, incorrect. The way it should have been written is a journey of a thousand miles begins with a map. Yeah. A map. It begins with a strategy. You don't want to be a thousand miles down the road and to find out that you're going the wrong direction. Right. But uh, so the first strategy in making these resolutions working realities and overcoming or managing our habits is we have to stop rationalizing the idea that I can't. You can't teach old dog new tricks. That's just me. After all, nobody's perfect. The truth is, you can teach any old dog a new trick if you make the rewards important enough. So we have to stop rationalizing, excusing, right? Yeah, so even, even the rationalization that these self-destructive habits, they're just so difficult to overcome, uh, or I started this when I was a kid, this is too deeply Or it's ingrained. not as bad as something else. Yeah, at least I'm not doing X. Yeah. Okay, okay. So the first strategy, if you want to be successful, you got to stop rationalizing. Second strategy is you need a strategy. You know, uh, you, you have to have an idea of what you're trying to accomplish and why. Why is this so important? Kind of visualize yourself no longer having this habit you're trying to overcome because yeah. that's what resolutions really are where a renunciation of old habits and the desire to establish a new one. So you got to have a picture, uh, apply the strategy of a picture, and then follow some of these other steps that we're going to talk about. Well, the picture, John, how, how have you seen people have success with the picture? Do they, you know, some people will have a dream board or they will um, talk with a spouse or a partner or somebody about, what you know? How do you see me? And they try to get different perspective on themselves that way. How do you encourage people to have a different view of themselves for the future? Well, I like the idea of a dream board. I think that's. I think it's cute. I think it's uh, creative. But I also think <clears throat> the question. There's power in questions, and the question would be, how do you think your life would be different if this habit was no longer present in your life? Okay. What could you accomplish then that you can't accomplish now? Actually seeing yourself having have this habit removed from you. Okay. So questions are kind of like dream boards. Yeah, they right? are. Yep. Yep. I think another important strategy is to be realistic. Realistic. You know, learning to manage an old habit is not going to happen fast. Nor is the resolve going to be consistent. But remember, periodic failures are better than habitual slavery. Hmm. So be realistic. These habits have been around and they've had us for a long, long time. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like um, that's, that's one reason why people don't address some of these bad habits, because they don't think that they can be realistic. They think, well, if I either go all or nothing— and if I ever well, I tried fail, last year, some of the right. some of the resolutions are the same ones I had last right. year. I wasn't successful then. Right. What makes me think I'd be successful now? These these are big things. These are big problems. Right. Right. So so this this disbelief that you can manage better and better yeah. is part of the undermining of of your success. So let's just be realistic. There's going to be periodic failure. You're not going to be consistent. But periodic failures are better than habitual slavery. 
And you can even build into your plan maybe some uh, some acknowledgement of the baby steps, even uh, some mile markers or some small celebrations or some whatever, if if that helps to reinforce the the realistic nature of it, I would imagine. Well, if you think of maturity, people talk about maturity. If you think of maturity, it's really about recovery. So maturity is not about perfection. Right. And so if you learn to measure your maturity and how quickly you recover from a setback, Hmm. then the quicker you can recover, the more maturity you're showing. So along with accepting the difficulty of learning to manage an old habit, you have to accept the fact that you're going to be imperfect and you're going to prone to make mistakes. Yeah. And there's nothing sacred about any starting point. So we don't have to wait till January 1st. Right. When you slip back into an old habit, the quicker you can recover, the better management of that habit it will become. Yeah. Until one day you will recover so quickly, it'll look like it's seamless. It didn't look like you struggled or you, you, you had a periodic failure at all. Yeah. So the quicker you can recover, the more maturity you're showing. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. And that's, that's encouraging uh, to think about it that way. I think that probably in, in our American Western mindset, we think of maturity as not having to deal with those childish struggles yeah. anymore but that's, that's right. not realistic that's it's not all real behind life. us now correct it's all behind us. correct yeah instead it's I, I like the the speed of recovery or the speed of resilience and restarts uh that that makes a lot of sense so let's talk about being encouraged another strategy is enthusiasm and encouragement strengthen self-discipline and resolve it, pr- it promotes an attitude of stick to You've got to be encouraged. Remember, you can change the past. I said that earlier. I said people struggle all the time thinking, well, if I could only change the past. Right. What is today, tomorrow? What is today, tomorrow, yesterday? It's, yeah, it's yesterday. It's the past. Yeah. And if you change enough of your todays, you will in time have changed the past. (laughs) You see? I like it. So you're not stuck with the past. The past is only your present. Change today and tomorrow, that's yesterday, and you will have changed the past. But you have to be enthusiastic. You have to be encouraged. You have to realize that you're imperfect. There's going to be periodic failures. And what you want to do is measure your maturity, which means measure your recovery. So what does it look like to build some of that enthusiasm and encouragement into your life if if maybe that doesn't come as naturally to someone and and maybe they're feeling a little bit low or discouraged? How, How would you coach someone to build enthusiasm or put encouraging people into their life, or or what do you think? Well, I always think it's good to to hang out and associate with people who are constructive and positive and honest. I think that's all very, very good. I think it's also important to learn to compliment yourself. That has oftentimes been forgotten. We sometimes think of complimenting and praising ourselves as somebody else's job, or maybe it's narcissistic. But anytime you get a compliment, anytime you're affirmed by somebody else, Privately and silently, follow it up with another compliment. Mm. So if you said, I like some of your ideas, then I would say to myself privately inside, yes, and I think they're smart. Mm -hmm. You know, or or something like that. But follow up compliments with your own internal compliments. There's an old uh, question that you may have heard many times, and that is, If a tree falls in a forest and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, the answer is, of course it does. Life is animated even without us. Life goes on. But the more important question is, if you accomplish something of value and worth, 
And there's no other voice but yours to acknowledge and uh, compliment mm -hmm. yourself. Will that be enough? Mm -hmm. And it has to be. It has to be. No, yeah. Nobody will know how easy or how difficult something was but you. Yeah, yeah. And so your voice matters. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? That, that reminds me of something else that you've talked about a lot, which is the idea of belonging. And uh, I was thinking about when you feel like you don't belong. Um, oh, you know what? It was Brene. I, I heard Brene Brown just talking about how she felt like an outsider growing up, but as she has developed and matured and grown, she's decided that the place where she belongs first is with herself. And yeah. that if she belongs here, that that's the, that's the beginning of confidence and security. And then she can enter into other belongings in a more healthy way. And that's sort of what you're saying with encouragement. Mm -hmm. Another strategy, and I think this is, is probably most important, is don't put yourself in a tempting situation. Okay. Okay. So learning to manage an old habit or acquiring a new one is harder at the beginning. Therefore, the wise individual doesn't put oneself in a tempting situation that risks sabotaging any new effort, any new strategy. Mm. So don't put yourself in tempting situations. Yeah, yeah. Why do you think that that is so difficult for us? Do we, do we like to think that we can handle it or we like the thrill of playing with fire or is it just poor planning? I think it's a lack of awareness. Mm. I mean, I think, to give you an example, I was just talking about this with a client, and uh, I was saying they were having trouble with their weight management, right? It's really not a problem of weight loss. It's always a, pre a problem of management. Mm -hmm. Everything is about management. Feelings, emotions, diet, habits. It's all about managing. There's no curing. And so I was saying that... Uh, you know that you should not drink and drive. Everybody kind of knows that, mm -hmm. right? Because you, your response time and you start becoming unconscious about things around you and all like. But very few people know that you shouldn't eat in front of television. Mm. I mean, people are going, what? Uh. Yeah, you shouldn't eat in front of the television or computer. And why is that? because you're not aware of how fast you're eating yeah. or how much you're eating. Yeah. And then when the commercial comes, you go back to the kitchen and reload. Mm. You should never do anything unconsciously. Yeah. That's how we all get in trouble. You can't manage if you're unconscious. And so I think sometimes we put ourselves in tempting situations, not consciously, but unconsciously. You know, uh, we, we have these uh, routines, yeah. habits, you know, uh, if things are familiar. So, and so I think without being conscious, that, that, that's how it happens. So there may be some habits around the habit that we want to change that also need to be adjusted, right? There, there may. Well, I think a habit of, of doing things unconsciously is certainly a habit that we all have. Yeah. I just, I, I didn't, know the, didn't know the gun was loaded. I, I, I wasn't aware. Mm. Yeah. yeah, well, where were you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking of uh, if there are some things, if I'm trying to spend less time on social media, uh, I may have to include a new habit of plugging my phone in, having a charging station. So it's at, at night, I come in the house, I have this charging station, I put it down, and that habit helps me to break the habit of just scrolling incessantly or whatever. So there's, there's some well, kind of support habits. Yeah. I, you know, you know how many times, I'm not saying this to you, I'm saying it generally, sure. philosophically. You know how many times you pick up a hard liquor or a beer bottle per day, right? Right. But you probably don't know how many times you check your cell phone. Fair. So it's a lack of awareness. So I don't know, and I'm, I, I should know this by now. I don't know if there's an app that counts down how many times you picked up your cell phone, how many times you've checked your cell phone. But that would be a great app. If somebody hasn't designed it, you should now. <laughs> but, uh, it, it, you know, I think it starts with uh, uh, 
technology-free zones. Yeah. I think we should ha have that kind of awareness where we have technology-free zones. Yeah. And I think they start with meal times, yeah. whether it's with family or friends out in a restaurant or whatever. There's got to be technology-free zones. You're not going to be successful at having technology-free zones if you're not conscious, if you're not aware. So I think building in some of those free zones makes us much more aware of the use of technology. It's not technology addiction. It's technology mismanagement. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's the newest, uh, newest dependency. It is. It is. It's running rampant. Yeah, I, I would say the, the next thing you, you should focus on is focus on trying. Trying, not on succeeding. Huh. Okay. It, it, it seems counterintuitive that you wouldn't try to succeed, but. The focus is on trying. Make your goals or risks, uh, don't make them too difficult. Uh, you see, when you over-focus on outcomes, the risks and, 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 and whatever you're trying to accomplish becomes more difficult mm -hmm. when you focus on outcomes. Focus on change, mm. not results. Okay. Because if you change, you're going to have different results. But if you focus on results, you're not likely to change. Okay. Focus on, on, on change. You see, a successful strategy focuses on trying to succeed. Pay attention to the efforts that you're expending and the steps that you're taking. Because the essence of well-established habits is psychological rigidity. When you have well-established habits, you're psychologically rigid, rigid. Yeah. Therefore, absolutely fundamental to successfully managing an old habit or acquiring a new one is flexibility and slowly driving towards your objective, managing your life difficult, yeah. differently. Yeah. And remember what the immortal words of Muhammad Ali. <laughs> When he said, impossible is not a fact, it's just an opinion. Huh. I like that. And that, that, is, that kind of includes a lot of what we've been talking about, managing, uh, managing the process instead of cures, right? And being realistic, um, trying and not focusing on success necessarily or the outcomes it's it it's encouraging. It it helps me think that I don't have to be perfect. I can just be making progress. And well, it's a lot lighter. It is. You know, it's not so burdensome to try to succeed at everything. Yeah. Yeah. And and to think that you won't have periodic failures. Some people give up any new attempts when they start failing. Yep. When you know they fall off the wagon. Yep. They don't think about maturity is how quickly you recover. They think maturity is. I wouldn't have to recover. Right. I shouldn't have to recover. I, I should be better than this. So I think that I think that's really the strategies. I think I may have combined a couple. Stop rationalizing. Apply a strategy. Be realistic. Be encouraged. Get better at recovery. Don't put yourself in a tempting situation. And focus on trying, not on succeeding. Yep. Now, yep. as you're talking with people in your in your uh, practice as uh, an active therapist, um, what what are you seeing right now entering into a new year, a new decade? Is are there some recurring themes that we're hitting on where people are are really consistently tripping up that they're struggling with? I think people are anxious now about meaning. Meaning, yeah. Because I, I think material wealth, material success, has kind of played out its day. Mm. I think that we realize that if you can afford food and you can afford housing, uh, that there's a diminishing returns when you emotionally divorce your family in the pursuit of more material comfort. Yeah. And I think material comfort and material accomplishment is had its day. Hmm. And I think people are moving now into meaning. I want to have more 
time with my family. I want to have more quality time. I want to pursue things that I'd like to pursue. I'd like to have more meaning. I'd like to make more impact. None of these are material. Right. Right. None of this is accomplishment, but accomplishment in a different way. It's moving inside rather than outside. Yeah. And I'm hearing more and more people, they articulate it in different ways, but I think people are moving inside now. Yeah. Yeah. And so as you think about this this process, the habit and then these strategies for building uh, changes in our habits, are how are you coaching people that are searching for meaning and fulfillment and kind of moving away from materialism? Are you seeing some 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 of these strategies play out in that way? And are there a couple of practical things that you're encouraging people to think about? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, If you didn't have to strive and struggle with life, what would you do with your time? Hmm. What would you pursue? If money were not an object, where would you invest yourself? Not your money, but your time. We all have more time than money. Where would you invest your time? Where would you... Where would I catch you spending your, your, your moments? Mm. And it, just to get freed up, okay, just to free yourself up from the, the, the striving, yeah. you know, the accomplishing, yeah. the performance. Where, where, would you, where would I find you? Mm. Because like you said before, there's so much of this, this life that's just on autopilot and striving for many of these people has just become an autopilot thing. And you just helping them pause and bring awareness to, is this, it was what you're doing, what you would choose to do if you didn't need the money? <laughs> just, mm-hmm. just bringing that awareness can be a huge step in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, what do you admire most? Mm. You know, and, and sometimes people look at their kids and the reason they go to these, you know, uh, sports activities, the reason they do this is because they, they identify with that, that time in their life when I used to run around the field and used to throw the ball, kick the ball, whatever it was about the ball. It's always a ball somewhere. <laughs> but, you know, they identify with that. Yeah. And yet they, they remain somewhat aloof from childhood, not really knowing how to play. I'll tell you, if you want the, the best idea for 2020 yeah. for a startup business, Start a company that teaches people to play. Hmm. We've lost our capacity to play. And I'll tell you, you'll know more about a person in an hour of play than you will in an hour of conversation. Hmm. See how they play hmm. and see how much they enjoy. Hmm. But those are the kinds of things that are meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, get out of your adulthood and get out of your seriousness and get out of all that and, and, and go out and find a ball. I love it. I love it. And I resonate with that. I've, I've discovered that, that growing up is a spiritual disadvantage, uh, that, that the, the more we grow up, the, the less I'm actually my childlike self that I want to be and trying to— str- Well, I think, a, I think a better word is growing out, hmm. not growing up. You're growing out of too much. Mm. You leave behind too much. I like that. That's why you envy your children. That's why you go and you try to take time off work so you can go to their games. It's because at least vicariously, you can get close to yeah. what you've grown out of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's grow back in. Yeah, that's why all these dads are getting in fights on the sideline of their kids' soccer <laughs> games. <laughs> all that p- p- pent-up resentment of wishing that they could still live their childhood. Exactly, and you still can. Hmm. You can. There's, yeah. We've, we've. I think, I think there's a lot of things that are under review, and should be. <laughs> I like. That's a great way to say that. Well, per- personally, for you, John, I you've you've lived like uh, several lifetimes already in your uh, short years on this earth, and um, I-, I wonder if there's anything that comes to mind for you, uh, the journey that you've been on from. Uh, your exposure to, you know, being a therapist for Hollywood celebrities, to your work with nonprofits and uh, 
third world countries and uh, and then being on the air for 15 years and all this kind of stuff. And then now here you are, you, you still are so active, you still are so engaged. You may or may not need the money, but you still meet with people, multiple people every single day, helping them grow and change their lives. Uh, is mm-hmm. that the kind of decisions that you're making for meaning? Uh, are you playing that out now in these years? You know, when you go through that kind of uh, chronology, I, I feel older than I may be. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, I think, I think uh, mine uh, comes back to meaning. I don't want to do anything that's meaningless. Mm. I want to do things that are meaningful. I want to spend my time where I feel like I'm not persuaded, but where I feel a certain kind of calling. Yeah. I think I'm always better when I'm called to something than when I'm persuaded to do something. Sure. So I'm saying no more. Um, I've got uh, uh, a, a new project that, that I'm doing, <clears throat> and that is uh, I'm finishing three books that I wrote. Uh, I wrote my first book in 2002, my second one in about 2005, and then the third one in about 2004. 14, and I never published any of them. <laughs> I just wrote them to see if I could write. <laughs> and, and now I'm going back and reading that, uh, the work I'm doing, and I'm, I'm fairly impressed with myself. <laughs> and so I've decided that I would find a publisher. And so I'm, uh, I'm beginning to uh, publish that. The first one will come out in the spring called uh, Therapy Stories. Huh. And the byline in the title, Therapy Stories, is that it sometimes takes more than an answer to solve a problem. Mm. So they're true to life stories. and um, uh, I love it. Well, I look forward to reading it. And you may not want to be a client of mine because I write about you. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> No. At least, at least, call me Calvin or something when you. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it, John. I uh, I look forward to the books, obviously, and uh, and and to the next time we get to do this again. It's always a pleasure to have you on. It's, Valentine's is coming. Valentine's is coming. Let's talk about it, and then uh, <laughs> and then I'm excited to have you at the at the Spirit Farm retreat too in April. That's going to well, be. That's right. That's going to be fantastic. That's right. Thank you for being a part of that. Yeah, that's going to be exciting. It will be. We'll have intimate time. We'll have a lot longer time with people. Yeah. And we'll do some of that play that you were talking about. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Thanks for having me. Of course, always. We'll, We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, John.